Hello there, folks, and welcome back once again to South Bank Live, episode 43, our weekly YouTube broadcast where we discuss some of the latest events in markets and answer some questions from our viewers. Uh, joining me this evening is John Butler once again. John, how are you getting on this evening? Oh, very well. It's a lovely spring evening here. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm currently in Croatia at a crypto conference, and it was very, uh, very pleasing to get a lot, nice bit of sunshine, very nice part of the world. Hadn't been to Croatia before. Uh, and it was quite a contrast between, you know, this very still, you know, lovely coastal seaside uh, ambiance, uh, while contrasted with absolute carnage uh, in the markets at the minute. There is no shortage of things that we can discuss this evening. I'm sure we could go on for many hours if we want to. Of course, we shall be limited to our uh, our one hour for this evening. Good evening to everybody joining us in the chat. Uh, it's good to see some regular faces. Uh, hello to Andrew, our uh, Cold War submariner, and to David and Jason. Uh, <laughs> hi, my name is Jason. I am an alcoholic. Me too. Me too, Jason. Uh, ha uh, Harry says, hey, everyone, and Edward. Hello to all. If you're watching a recording of this and you do like it, do feel free to like and subscribe if you are enjoying this brand of content. And uh, yeah, just to start us off with, I thought we could start in a kind of light-hearted note with our long short segment though given the the amount of shorting opportunities at the minute uh you know there's really uh, it's not really all that light-hearted but john i'll let you lead off with your long and your short for this week oh sure well i mean as you say there's carnage out there and where there's risk there's opportunity and as as rothschild fam lord rothschild famously said back in the day you know don't don't buy until there's blood on the streets um we're starting to see some blood and, and, and what I see, I see a couple of curiosities in the market now. Yes, everything is selling off, and yet one thing has turned. And that to me is an interesting indicator that we're moving, we're going through a phase transition now. We've seen tremendous dollar strength for many weeks now. And that has been almost a daily affair. And yet versus all currencies, that's been the case until basically until today. And we're seeing the yen suddenly becoming very strong while the dollar is still rising versus other currencies. Now, that to me is hugely significant. And the reason why is because that's a proper canary in the coal mine for a general global flight to liquidity, a general global de-risking, a general global deleveraging. And the reason why is because the Japanese are, in aggregate, huge net savers, whereas the, uh, the US and the dollar block uh, world, as it were, are actually large uh, net borrowers uh, in the international monetary system. And so when everybody flees out of what is their perceived risk into what is safest and most liquid, the Japanese flee back into their own currency. They flee back into the yen and the yen strengthens. That's happening now. So this is no longer a sort of general risk off phenomenon to simply raise liquidity. It's a proper flight even back into your home base currency, which you can see in yen strength. That means I believe we're moving out of the phase we've been in, which is just a general squeeze on excessive risk taking to something that is much more frightening uh, and which is potentially indicative of a much more fundamental uh, financial crisis where, where banks literally cannot, um, cannot continue to extend the credit they've been extending. They've got a call in their credit lines, and that includes cross-border credit lines. That includes credit lines from Japan to the rest of the world, so on and so forth. In that sort of environment, when you do get into proper crisis mode, central banks tend to respond. And of course, the most important central bank in the world is the Fed. So the Fed may actually be close to blinking now. And if the Fed gives any indication whatsoever that they are prepared to ease liquidity if necessary to relieve this situation, then the dollar cannot will not continue to strengthen. That'll be it. That'll be the end of the dollar strength that we've seen. And yet, of course, that's not a panacea for everything. And so the dollar may begin to weaken, but that doesn't necessarily mean other currencies have good reasons to strengthen either. And that's when I think you'll see the reversal in gold and possibly silver and other precious metals. They're getting beaten up now in this general flight uh, to liquidity, general a flight to safety, because while they do offer safety in a, in a very fundamental sense, to the extent that anyone's a leveraged player in gold and silver or other precious metals, and they've been borrowing dollars, borrowing yen, borrowing whatever currency it might be for precious metals exposure, hey, if your lines of credit are called in, you have to liquidate positions. 
That's what's going on in the precious metals now, hence why they've also continued to decline versus gold, whereas the yen's reversed. But that, to me, is the opportunity. The yen reversing is telling you we're near the dollar peak, in my opinion, and we're near the precious metals bottom. So that's the trade. Get back into precious metals on this dip if you haven't been building a position already and get outright short the dollar to the extent you're able uh, to do so. A very interesting pair indeed, John, as ever. A uh, quick reminder to everybody, we cannot give uh, financial advice in these episodes. It is purely for informational and hopefully entertainment purposes only. I think for my long short this week, uh, based on what I've seen over the past weeks, uh, my short would be on the expectations of journalists, as I've seen two, uh, two articles in the past week, which were quite with quite curious headlines, though rather similar, uh, both claiming, firstly, that it were, uh, the US inflation was had unexpectedly remained high uh, over the past month. Uh, I don't know who it was that didn't expect that. Uh, it seems more like the journalist was trying to uh, trying to imply that this was unexpected. And then another saying how uh, UK growth was unexpectedly low over the past month, which seemed uh, again like this was uh, they were they were trying to massage a narrative rather than actually report on reality. I think for my long for this week, uh, I'm long old people owning houses. Now, this is not something that uh, is especially new. This is much more of a momentum trade. But there was an article in Metro, which, uh, which I thought, you know, this has to be a signal that we're, it's getting really bad. The UK's oldest homeowner, aged 106, bought a house for £800, and it's now £550,000. Uh, a very interesting story indeed. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this. Boomers owning houses and young people are uh, not. is nothing new, but I think it's going to get a lot worse. I think we're going to see a lot more, uh, you know, centenarians who have their telegrams from the, the Queen owning houses, while a lot of young people don't, given the, uh, the current situation. Uh, John, kicking off into uh, our theme for this week, you were speaking about currencies a lot in your long short. I thought there were a few major themes that we could explore a bit at the beginning, and then we can open up a lot more to the chat because uh, I can already see there are plenty, plenty of questions and plus, plenty of comments. So number one here, uh, we have seen a big dollar rally. You said you expect that uh, to uh, to ease off in the future. There is a chart I'd like to show uh, folks of the dollar index. Uh, this is an index that is uh, the value of the dollar relative to other currencies. So we see that line going up, what you're looking at is uh, is the dollar getting stronger and the dollar, dollar being able to acquire more of the other major currencies like uh, euro, sterling, uh, yen, franc, etc. Uh, so as you can see, there was a massive one, a massive spike up to 2014. We saw again another uh, massive spike in the beginning of 2020, and that's when uh, the Fed stepped in and did a massive easing program. And then we're once again seeing that rise all the way uh, past the 2020 peak. And this is causing a lot of stress uh, in the rest of the world. There were a couple of articles here that I thought we could explore as well, which I thought were interesting because we're seeing the uh, the, the rise in inflation and the uh, the um, the appearance of stagflation, the uh, the economic debacle that uh, so many feared that from the 1970s uh, appearing once again. And uh, that was you know very much a high inflation, low growth world, and hence the name stagflation. But I think we're going to see, uh, well, we are now seeing this very interesting uh, spectacle where cash is seen as something that everyone should be owning in the market because everything's going down. And yet at the same time, cash is what is being uh, neutered by uh, this inflationary force. So I think there was a, there's an article here looking at uh, how cash is king, I think, at the minute. I'll see if I... Uh, yeah, cash is the only winner in a market gripped by stagflation fear. That's from Yahoo this week. Uh, and then there was another, uh, which was looking a bit more, I think, at the dollar. Yeah, and this was uh, this is actually a report that came from the BIS uh, a few years ago. But it's relating to that dollar rally that we've seen. Uh, so the BIS famously said that uh, there may be no winners from a stronger dollar, not even the U.S., because the U.S. Uh, has so much debt and, of course, uh, import so much from abroad and all these folks abroad borrow lots of things in dollars. So a very strong dollar does a lot of harm to those economies and it all comes home to roost in the US. So I find it a very interesting situation where 
we've got the dollar rallying a lot, but inflation in the US is still really, really high. So when the dollar is rallying, it's not really rallying that much against uh, real commodities. It's not rallying that much in terms of giving the every man a lot more purchasing power. It's just rallying against the falling value of these other paper currencies, which are just falling even more. And in that scenario, it seems very strange that people are thinking cash is king. We want dollars when inflation in the, in the States is re being reported as 8% and it may well be higher than that. John, I'd like your thoughts on that and how that ties into your, into your thinking that this has gone too far for the dollar and it's got to go down from there. Well, look, the, the, the rational investor who's also unleveraged is not compelled to do anything. But right now, you're having a dynamic play out where, of course, a lot of the investment world is leveraged in some way. They're borrowing some currency in order to invest in some security, whatever it is. And if your bank basically call, you know, calls you up and says, hey, you know, we have to cut your credit line uh, because of what our perceived you know, rise, growing stress in the system, um, you have no choice in the matter. I mean, you have to liquidate positions and, and you have to do what you have to do. To, to reduce that perceived leverage and remain within whatever your new credit limits happen to be. And so if you're able to deleverage by selling off, you know, whatever it happens to be that you've got, yes, of course, you're heading back into cash temporarily, and you're part of the reason why prices for assets in general are coming down. But if you're not carried out on a stretcher, if you do live to fight another day, if you weren't over leveraged and, you're man and you manage to square your book, then you look around. You're now unleveraged. You've got some capital left to deploy. You look around and you think, well, let me get this straight. Inflation's running in double digits. It might stay at this level for a prolonged period of time. There's all kinds of risk out there right now. Uh, momentum in asset markets in general is, is, is awful. Um, I'm pretty bearish on the state of the world. Do you simply sit in cash knowing you're guaranteed to lose real purchasing power? Or do you look for an alternative? And this is sort of the mentality that I think began to arrive as we transitioned out of the depth of the 2008 financial crisis into 2009, when people started looking around and thinking, hey, the world's changed a bit. Um, I can't just sit in cash necessarily, but what should I consider buying now? Gold was the first thing to recover. It was the first thing to recover. Months yeah. before other assets began to recover, gold had already recovered by double digits. I would not be surprised, given the state of the world today, if gold not only leads that recovery, you know, post necessary deleveraging, it leads that recovery, but it will probably lead it by a larger amount, in my opinion, this time around. That is, gold could really be way out in front uh, if indeed the Fed and other central banks realize that what's happening now is going to require some sort of policy response at some point, some sort of easing of conditions. Stagflation or no, high inflation or no, if you're a central bank and your job is to keep the system liquid, which it is, yep. they'll do something at some point if things continue like this. Right. Just to clarify there, John, because looking at 2008, 2009, if we go back to 2009, when where gold really uh, starts kicking off when it comes to its spot price, though, of course, all, all this gold, when it came to physical gold, was very, very hard to get a hold of by that point anyway, from the 2008 financial crisis for the, uh, for the smaller investors who realized that something was, was badly wrong. If we're looking at, if we're making sort of a, a comparison here, by 2009, the eye of the storm had somewhat passed when it came to the you know, absolute credit risk uh, from Lehman, you were getting that policy response by then. If we're making a comparison to today, how long do you think it will take before we get that same policy response and gold then? Uh, oh, it's, look, it's, it's very difficult to time it. I'm just saying that when people start to realize that if we deleveraged a bit, but policymakers are going to have to come in to rescue the system. Nevertheless, where is the marginal investor going to deploy what remaining capital they have in what is a, a, an inflationary environment? Based on the 2008, 2009 example, I think gold's going to be the first horse out of the gate and it might have a big lead uh, in you know, what will become at least a small reflation race, say, as fresh liquidity arrives into the system. That's what I would expect to happen based on, admittedly, 
historical analogy and combining the way I see the world today with the way I see the world or saw the world, as it were, in 2008, 2009. As I recall, gold was already recovering before the end of the calendar year 2008. I think it was already recovering in December. Everything right. else continued to sell off until March. That's three months. And again, there was a double digit percentage move of gold. Uh, it's certainly a lot more in excess of the you know, relative to the broad uh, risk market, as it were, during that period of time. So I think the potential for a similar thing to play out is probably even greater this time around, given that we have inflation already in the mix. It's not just asset reflation people might be expecting. It's actual inflation you've got to protect against an even stronger argument for getting back into gold as quickly as possible once this once this leverage clear out uh, has has taken place. Yeah, I guess there's that, that you could call it a golden window there, that three uh -huh. months before beforehand, right? Indeed. Um, when it comes to the the leverage clear out, uh, the liquidity drain as we're as we're getting at the minute, and how bad it could get at the minute, where do you think this might blow up? some parts of the financial system and make what we what we currently have a lot worse because we're already seeing a lot of warning indicators with as you're saying uh, the rise in the yen the rise in the dollar one concern i have is that we are actually in a situation now where we're suffering under both endogenous and exogenous negative shocks now I mean, for those not familiar with you know statistical uh terminology Endogenous processes are those that occur within a given system. Exogenous ones are things that change outside the system, but nevertheless somehow affect things inside the system. Okay. So, for example, central banks making policy errors as they go about regulating their economies and whatnot, uh, that's endogenous. That's an endogenous shock if they get something wrong, right? If they allow inflation to spiral out of control just because of their own policy mistakes. An exercise in the shock is something like a war or, or uh, something that constrains the supply of key resources, uh, something like that. We're getting both now. I, I believe we're seeing both the legacy of numerous sizable past policy mistakes, chickens coming home to roost, if you will, but we're also seeing some you know, clearly unexpected, unanticipated phenomena around the world that are going to have a huge impact on all manner of economic goods, services, activities of all kinds, and they're converging. And we really haven't seen something like this in a long time. I mean, the, the 70s were not this bad. Uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, proportion of the world that is being affected by the, these events that are currently unfolding, again, endogenous and exogenous. So I mean, this this is it, it's going to be difficult to to sort of try and stay ahead of this one and see how it plays out. But that's kind of the that's the unfortunate situation that we've ended up in, and and, and it just means that we're going to be in an environment. And I, look, I've been talking about this for a long time, and I, I don't want to take too much credit for for predicting things in any sort of specific detail. But this general defensive sense that we were in for something pretty ugly. Uh, it, it is playing out now, and, and I think it's very important for people to get serious about this. We really are in wealth and capital preservation mode uh, rather than anything in terms of just keeping a hold of the wealth in real terms that you have accumulated to date is really the goal here now. It's not about trying you know, to get into the latest, greatest, you know, get rich quick scheme or something like that. Yeah. Oh, well, John, I think you should be able to take credit, certainly for the stagflation call. This is something you've been... Uh really bang the table about that's what you know we are we are we we should be expecting uh given the all of the policy combinations we've seen over the past few years uh personally i generally leaned on the stagflation side rather than the deflation side that a lot of people uh were, were keen on um and it but of course this is with 21st century characteristics so uh, how this will play out exactly uh, remains to be remains to be seen and as you say in a way it could be an awful lot worse there are so many things there are so many more uh, leveraged, multiplied effects that can take place in this globalized world now, which couldn't have taken place back in the 70s, technology uh, and supply chains and things like that, making things uh, even more, uh, what would be the word, I guess, even more fragile. 
Now, we do have plenty of comments here uh, tonight. Good evening to everybody who has just joined us. Or <laughs> evening all. Welcome to the Scarf Conf Lab from John Capperthwaite. And this is, uh, uh, I, I guess, a reference to John's lack of a scarf this evening. It's warm enough. We're in the, uh, in the nice nice spring weather. Yeah, it's uh, May. It's, who, who wears a scarf in May? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, somebody who's uh, very, very fashion oriented. May, I bet you Christine Lagarde wears a Hermes scarf in <laughs> That would be my that would be my guess. Uh, good evening to Apex Cipher, who's joined us once again, uh, and John Simons from Aberdeen. Hello, John. Great to great to hear from you. He shall be watching it later after it's been recorded. Well, I hope you enjoy this one, John. Uh, Edward, hi both. More superb insight, please. Well, great great that you enjoyed, Edward. That's very uh, quite a compliment indeed. I hope we're delivering the goods there. Uh, and I would be interested in anyone in the chat on their on their thoughts on what their long shot would be for this evening. We do have Andrew here, who is long on silver. Apex Cipher, who is short Luna, referring to the recent uh, the recent crypto debacle that is is continuing with the Terra uh, the Terra ecosystem. Hello to uh, Natalia in the chat over at LinkedIn. Uh, we do have some uh, some interesting interesting comments here too. Uh, this one from Apple. Uh, which is uh, regarding safe havens and currencies. Now, I was thinking about this actually the other day because I wasn't hearing anybody speaking about it. Uh, hello, Boaz and John. Will there also be a flight to the Swiss franc? I was thinking about this. Is the Swiss franc actually still a safe haven hard currency anymore? Is the market still treating it that way, John? Should the market be treating it like that? Because, of course, the Swiss National Bank has been out there instead of buying lots and lots of gold, as in the olden days, but buying lots and lots of tech stocks, which have recently gotten wrecked. Well, Switzerland's about more than just the central bank. Uh, Switzerland is a large net creditor to the rest of the world on a per capita basis. That said, it's a very, very small uh, country with a very, very large financial system. And of course, if you get into a general financial distress globally, uh, given the fact that Switzerland has all manner of exposures to the rest of the world, I'm not sure it's quite the safe haven it used to be. So while they are net creditor to the rest of the world and they might be repatriating some capital and yes, other factors equal, that would give some strength to the currency to the extent that the banks who are huge leverage players who are financing their external lending books in Swiss francs, um, they may find they're facing some defaults. And so it's not easy for me to conclude what the net net effect is going to be there. So it, that's not as clear to me, Where, whereas Japan, which I mentioned earlier, is, is a much clearer case where, don't get me wrong, Japan's a huge net creditor to the rest of the world for sure. And so indirectly, it's exposed to just about everything. But they also have a huge manufacturing and export economy at home, unlike uh, Switzerland, which has some of that to be sure, but nothing on the scale uh, of Japan. Right. Good question from Sandeep. Uh, Janet Yellen said today uh, in the FS, uh, FSOC, concerned about treasury market functioning. What is it hinting towards, according to you? What's your take on that? With Janet Yellen, the treasury secretary, uh, concerned that uh, the market for US government bonds is not functioning by not functioning. Uh, what exactly do they mean by that, John? I, I, I think she means there's signs of stress in the repo market. So the, the repo market is based on the treasury market. What you do uh, in a repo is basically it's a form of overnight secured lending. So basically you lend money against treasury bond collateral. It's and like this, working, but for, uh, for bonds, right? Well, yeah, but, th but, that's how, that, but that's how you source your incremental leverage. And so when you get, when you get a general deleveraging, uh, then that can cause stress in the, in the in the repo market because there's just not enough collateral available uh, to support what's going on uh, as credit lines get pulled and, and, and whatnot. So that's I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that's exactly what she's referring to is signs of stress uh, in the repo market uh, where, where that incremental liquidity is is sourced. I mean, in theory, there can be a repo market in non-governmental securities too. You can borrow against any asset. Uh, if you're looking for incremental uh, leverage to apply to the purchase of a new asset. But in the U.S. market, from the Fed's perspective, it's the treasury repo market where shadow liquidity, shadow leverage, if you want to call it that, that's that's kind of where it's concentrated. And if you're looking for signs of stress, that's where you look. Why would you call it the shadow leverage and shadow liquidity market, John, when there is 
it's still in you know it's all through public uh, institutions it's still using well, bonds it, it is but you see traditionally the way banks uh created credit was through interbank lending yeah. And then, of course, eventually also loans to non-financial corporations, households, private individuals, so on and so forth. The, the, the repo market is, is, is a relatively modern innovation where it's not unsecured interbank lending anymore, pyramiding the credit uh, b- b- based on a, a reserve ratio, which is, which is not 100%. But it's basically borrowing against securities. And, and the securities, of course, if they're issued by the U.S. government, are seen as risk-free. And, and so that's, a, that's an uber-cheap uh, source of incremental financing for you know, whatever it is somebody might, might want to invest in. But the problem is that the Fed only sees that indirectly. They don't see it directly. You know, the Fed can walk into any bank at any moment, on any day of the week, and go through their whole loan book, see exactly what's going on, uh, and decide whether that bank is maybe doing something a little bit dangerous, maybe extending a little bit too much credit, uh, whatnot, or what you know, what, whatever it happens to be. But exactly who's borrowing against which Treasury security to do what? Huh, the, the, I mean, the, the 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 Fed doesn't necessarily know. It's much harder to see. And so that's one reason why you just look for general signs of stress in the repo market. It's kind of like physicists trying to observe a black hole. You can't observe it directly, but you see light getting bent around it indirectly, and you see that. That's kind of what the Fed can do by looking at the repo market. They can't see directly the black hole, but you know it's there when you see some of these things happening. And then, of course, you can investigate and try to come to terms with it. By that point, however, some big hedge fund is blown up, right? You know, the, the events will have already happened by the Fed, by the time the Fed actually discovers it. So central right. bank officials don't like this sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to hear Yellen talk about uh, talk about the repo market in that way, given the fact that it was in, what, late 2019? It was before the new era that uh, the Fed started really aggressively intervening in the repo market and the reverse repo market as well, if memory serves, to the tune of trillions of dollars. Like, what's your take on that? Because if we are to continue using the metaphor of looking at a black hole by uh, watching how light bends around it, in this case, it's almost like we're trying to mess around with the light to influence the black hole. Well, this is the problem, right? The Fed is the largest holder of treasuries. So in, in a way, right, as you know, post 2008, their portion of the treasury market has grown exponentially and it's huge now. I mean, I, I don't think it's half yet, but it's, it's really big now, right? And, 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 and in, in Japan's case, I mean, the Bank of Japan owns a huge portion of the, of the yeah. JGB market. But yeah, returning to the Fed, okay. So they, they've become you know, the biggest player in the market. And so effectively then, you know, they if they're the market and, and they want to affect market conditions, well, sure. I mean, they can they can call in repo or they can extend more repo credit, and they've been using that increasingly as a policy tool. As a result, it's kind of like a problem of their own creation. I mean, they may not see it that way, but at, but as you say, if if you've become the market and you're supposed to be setting policy, you can get into some sort of odd, you know, endogenous feedback loops, uh, which complicate, which probably complicate. Uh, policy implementation, and no one really knows precisely what the effects of that are going to be. It it is it is kind of funny sometimes how regulators approach these sorts of situations because they never expect to end up in this sort of situation, and yet you can't on the one hand tell banks, oh gee, you must be better capitalized, and then on the other hand tell them, oh could you please extend more credit because the economy is kind of weak. You you can't have it both ways, and yet the Fed has said you know things like that around the same time. Uh, many times in recent years, and it doesn't make any sense. And to say, oh, we want the treasury market to function normally, and then to be the single largest holder of it, and to let you know one crisis after another happen, um, it, it's as if we'd like the market to function normally, but we're the reason it's not functioning normally. I mean, what sense does that make to anybody? I mean, it doesn't. And it's just one more example of having ended up in a situation that nobody, no policymaker would have wanted and to end up in. And again, my favorite analogy or metaphor for this, I should say, is the Fed's entire management of the financial system at home and to a lesser extent globally, ever since the big financial crisis, has been to walk a tightrope backwards into a corner. 
And that's where they are now. And there's probably no way out <laughs> without further disruptions. Well, I don't know, John. The, uh, the use of the tightrope implies that they will suffer personally if they fall off. And uh, I, I, I just think that they, they would be fine. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe they have a safety net and not everyone who's dependent on their policies does. I think maybe they're, they're on the edge of the building pushing the, uh, the American public along the, the tightrope uh, backwards into a corner, perhaps, uh, you know, the, the average American saver, maybe. Well, look, it, it, it's all, it's always the average saver who ends up getting sacrificed uh, in situations like this. The fact is, as we know, to step back and look at the bigger picture, governments have borrowed and spent too much money. Banks have leveraged up too much and may, and extended all sorts of bad credit. This can't all be repaid in nominal terms without huge bankruptcies, unless the real purchasing power of the underlying currency of denomination of all that debt and leverage is significantly devalued. There's just no other way out other than very, very widespread bankruptcy, default, and the ensuing chaos that that would entail. Now, I'm not saying there isn't chaos through a huge devaluation either. There is. But it's the sort of chaos that tends to be less legal and political in nature, although it can be political. Uh, and it, so therefore, it's seen as more manageable by the powers that be. Bankruptcy, outright default in bankruptcy is a very messy process. Uh, a recent example of just how messy that can be, of course, is when Lehman went under. And so that's kind of a recent lesson to policymakers that when push comes to shove and they have a choice to make, are we going to allow the stress in the system to build and risk widespread defaults and bankruptcies? Or are we going to now basically devalue to relieve some stress on the system? They'll do the latter. I, I think the point is we don't know precisely when. And so it's very hard to play that timing game unless you have, you know, a, a red telephone you can pick up and speak to, you know, whoever it is, Janet Yellen or Powell or some other senior policymaker and have them tip you off and say, oh, yes, we're planning to ease liquidity under these conditions. This is how we're going to do it. And so this is how you want to position yourself. Uh, look, unless unless you have that sort of inside information, it's very, very difficult to play that game. Better is simply to get defensive. But by defensive, as we've already discussed, in a highly inflationary environment, sitting in cash is not a viable longer term defensive strategy. Ultimately, precious metals will recover. And when they do, that's where you're going to want to have a significant allocation. Yeah, there's. Uh, I would love to overhear a conversation like that from uh, with Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell. This is how we're going to rug the American public. This is how you need to take advantage of it. Uh, it, it does feel like um, you know some hard hard choices will need to be made, but we already know who it is. This is going to get this is going to get rugged at the end of it. Uh, we do have plenty of really good comments here. Um, interesting one from Lucid Chronicles. I bet the young generation will go to uni and study how to create a virus to kill off the boomers, then buy their houses. You know, funnily enough, uh, Lucid Chronicles, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, there was actually a hashtag, uh, boomer remover, uh, that was started by young people. Uh, that, well, allegedly, it may actually have just been an entire troll, troll, uh, troll farm, but they did manage to get it trending for a short while on Twitter before Twitter probably got rid of it. So you never know. Maybe, maybe that's what happened in Wuhan. Maybe it was, uh, it was, uh, it was some young folks trying to uh, trying to get their their hands on the property market. I'm not, I'm not too sure about that though. Uh, we do have lots of comments on uh, on Bitcoin at the minute, and indeed on gold. Uh, there are, yeah, a few of the a few questions here uh, regarding the the values of gold. So G comments: Buffett does not like gold, uh, and then uh, we do also have the. Uh, yeah, and then Lucid Chronicles again. Buffett likes to own things that make him money. Gold just stores wealth; it doesn't make money. Now, John, uh, speaking of Warren Buffett, uh, he has still been pretty bullish on the states as of late. Uh, I believe he's he's bought a fair amount of stock at the minute. Have you any comments on what the Oracle of Omaha has been up to of late? Well, when I look at the way he's been investing, and this is not just true recently, but th there's been a pattern now for some years. He's been arguably investing for a stagflationary environment. He's been investing in uh, cash generative businesses 
with fairly stable revenues, which in some cases are near monopolies uh, in the markets in which they operate. He's been investing in places with strong pricing power in sectors that have in companies that have strong pricing power. And he's been avoiding a lot of the intangible assets, which I believe are particularly overvalued uh, in, uh, given the environment uh, that we've entered into. So Buffett, I think, has been, he's not been talking about it because he does like to sound bullish. He does like to be a bit of a cheerleader. I think that's his personality. He doesn't like being a curmudgeon so much. And arguably, you could say his sidekick, Charlie Munger, plays the curmudgeon and Buffett plays the cheerleader. But actually, when they put their heads together, I think they pretty much agree. And that's how historically a lot of Berkshire decisions have been made. So yeah, look at his portfolio. It's actually a sensible stagflation portfolio. You know, he's got energy. He's got railways. He's got um, he, he, he's got some very, very stable, non-discretionary cons consumer stocks, you know, things that are always going to have reasonable demand, no matter how bad things get. But he's avoided discretionary sectors and he's avoided intangibly, intangible, heavy uh, sectors such as a lot of the tech out there. A very interesting comment. Uh, of course, there are lots of people who watch, who watch uh, what Buffett does, and plenty of people track his portfolio and things like that. Wonder if they, if the folks who just uh, you know buy Berkshire Hathaway stock, are sort of interested in ah, I'm now I'm now protected against uh, stagflation, or whether or not they were just more thinking of I'm just following this this legendary investor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, I, I think that. many people oh, see Berkshire Hathaway as just. Uh, the S&P 500 enhanced. That is, you're basically buying the U.S. stock market, but you're buying it in a way which has a good long historical track record of at least incrementally outperforming the broader stock market over the medium to long term. I, I think that's a very common mentality for people that buy Berkshire Hathaway. It's like, hey, you know, let's let Buffett and his pals, uh, you know, do the stock picking for us. But we do want broad exposure to the U.S. stock market. But, you know, they'll do it. That that I think is very, very common. Uh, so and, and why not? I mean, the track record uh, is, is a good one. Now, that said, it's sometimes not as good as some people claim. Uh, Buffett has occasionally, I stress occasionally, had multi-year periods of subpar performance. They tend to be associated, however, with bubbles that do subsequently correct. So you can't fault him too much for that. But there are some other value-oriented investment managers who don't have his scale, but certainly have track records at least as impressive as his. And if you shop around a little bit, I'm not going to mention any names here, uh, but if you shop around a little bit, it's not too difficult to stumble upon a few of these. And I'm invested in a couple of them myself. But you don't want to give away any of the goodies this evening, do you, John? Well, it, 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 it starts to become specific investment advice um, at that point, Boaz. So, okay. yeah. Okay. You've got to be a bit careful with that one. Maybe maybe, maybe a hint or something. Maybe, uh, but I'll, I'll leave I said you. I said value-oriented. I think there are – look, I mean, there are many prominent value managers out there. Do a, do a little Googling. Look at their five-year, 10-year, whatever it is, track records, if you like, and you'll find a handful of ones – who are managing, you know, a billion plus, uh, who have track records that are better than Buffett's. He's the idea that he's above and beyond everyone else. That's the point I'm trying to make. The idea that he is the best of all time is simply not true. Okay. The fact is he's been around longer than just about anyone else who's, who's in the business today. Uh, and that's nothing against that, but there are some very, very good people who just don't have quite that length of track record, but over the last five, 10 years, following a similar value oriented approach, uh, they've done better in some cases, substantially. So my impression with Buffett is an awful lot of it is just very consistent marketing and very good political connections that he has. And that's one of the reasons why he's been able to cultivate this image of being this kindly old grandfather, when in reality, he must be just one of the most ruthless guys out there. Well, I, 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 I suspect he was a ruthless guy for much of his life. I, I suspect he leaves some of that to other people now. Uh, and he's not quite as hands on ruthless, perhaps, as he as he used to be. Uh, perhaps given, you know, how old he is and whatnot. But certainly I don't think he got to where he is uh, without being quite ruthless along the way. Yeah, definitely. 
John this evening, John T, is long hovis, a very good call. Uh, my loaf was 95p, now £1.35p. More to come, £2 a loaf if the crop gets shriveled by autumn. Yeah, it does seem like a good one. Uh, hovis at the minute, I think I'll probably go for Freddo's. I think we're going to see £1 Freddo's, like, it, not too long. I think I think this is imminent, or they're just going to be absolutely tiny. Like they're well, there, be, there you go. I mean, shrinkflation's been around for years, and it may get uh, pretty severe uh, now that the actual rate of inflation is as high as it is. Lots of consumer firms out there, uh, you're mentioning food, but there are other products too, uh, are going to be looking for ways to pass on price increases while trying to, again, trick is kind of a nasty word, but trying to do what they can to make it appear that the price increase is not quite as large. Uh, and, and that's the way that you do it. You do a bit of shrinkflation. And mm -hmm. and so I would not be at all surprised to see a lot of that uh, showing up. Certain standard weights and measures, it's hard to do that because people will just refuse to buy them in very odd weights or volumes or things like that. But anything you can fudge a bit, like a Freddo perhaps, uh, is going to get either shrunk or, as you say, get so expensive that they're almost certain to, to lose a little bit of market share. Yeah, definitely. I think we're, uh, yeah, there's uh, this sort of 2020s, 1970s dynamic. I think we're going to see a lot more of the, the shrinkflation side, uh, as well as, of course, just the, the good old price hikes. Um, yeah, very good. Very good long for this week, John T. Northumberland says, there's a cold wind in Dorset. Well, Northumberland, I hope you're, uh, you're wrapped up warmly. This feels like the kind of message that's like activating a KGB sleeper agent or someone in the UK. But they just comment, there's a cold wind in Dorset. And that means that they are now going to break cover and uh, start some uh, start some some plan. Well, uh, I hopefully hopefully uh, yeah there there aren't any of those tuning in this evening. Uh, John, uh, well, Jay Burgess says in gold and uranium now for better or for worse. What's your thoughts on uranium at the minute, John? Because how does that react with this enormous liquidity drain we're seeing going on? Because the fundamentals are still very strong, right? Oh, absolutely. But as I said, look, if you need to re if you need to deleverage. If you need to raise liquidity, you just sell what you have. And so uranium, in my opinion, it can be very exposed to that in the short term. I do think it's a great long term play. I, I think it's just so obvious that much of the world has got itself into an energy crisis, which is largely of its own making. The fact that we have the conflict in Ukraine takes a situation that was already bad. We can't forget this. It's so easy for politicians to say, oh, gee, all these energy problems we're having, it's because we can't get the Russian gas now. No, we were having issues with periodic blackouts. Uh, we were having, you know, uh, keep in mind the, the bad winter we had when the solar panels in Germany were all covered with snow and, you know, they, they had rolling blackouts. California has been having rolling blackouts. There are lots of energy infrastructure issues that have been around for at least a few years now that have nothing to do with hostilities kicking off in Ukraine. Uh, so don't, you know, don't let don't let the politicians who have been in charge of making what are some very questionable decisions about energy infrastructure in recent years get away with that. They should be held to account for the stuff that, you know, that, that, that they did have control over. But yes, here's another example of endogenous and exogenous processes uh, coming together and creating a very, very bad energy situation. One of the only real you know, practical solutions to is to try to retain and expand what nuclear generation capacity already exists and build what you can going forward. Uh, it's going to be a long slog, but that does imply, in my opinion, a huge underlying base demand growth for uranium over the coming years. I, I think it's, it's, it's just inevitable. And uh, don't get me wrong, you know, there, there is some promising other, uh, alternative energy technology out there for sure, but the scale is just not the same. It's just not the same. Uranium could be scaled up by an, a huge, huge amount with known results in economic terms over the next 10 to 20 years, where it's still a huge question mark, whether more windmills, whether more you know, ba be or better battery tech or whatever it is can ever, ever, ever reach that sort of scale. And without sufficient scale, it's just not a big enough pool of liquidity to benefit enough investors who choose to pile in and ride the wave, as it were. So sure, there are small opportunities perhaps all over the place, but the single biggest energy opportunity in the world for the foreseeable future 
is nuclear. And that, of course, implies rising demand for uranium and a higher uranium price. It is uh, a very interesting, interesting prospect that we've got for energy just in general at the minute. Uh, I was, I thought it was incredibly cynical for the White House to start calling it the the Putin price hike when it came to energy costs and try to get that it's a nice, nice hashtag going along. So I've no doubt that when we start getting food riots, we're gonna they're going to be called the Putin food riots, and uh, maybe we'll even get the Putin graduate unemployment in the near future. But uh, we'll have to have to wait and see. Uh, an interesting comment here uh, from Gerard, uh, which is regarding uh, Bitcoin, which of course is. Uh, been not immune to the uh, liquidity drain that we've seen. There's been a, a lot of a lot of chaos in the crypto market at the minute. But being at this crypto conference, you wouldn't really have thought so. People are still pretty jolly. Um, Jared asks, how are those Central American countries like El Salvador and African nations like Nigeria reacting to the collapse of Bitcoin? Now, I believe Gerard is mistaking uh, the Central African Republic for Nigeria, uh, because I don't believe Nigeria has made a Bitcoin legal tender yet. Uh, but in the case of El Salvador and uh, and with Central African Republic, they made it legal tender. El Salvador makes a very big deal. Uh, the, the premier likes tweeting about when he buys Bitcoin. Uh, G uh, comments, El Salvador margin call coming soon. Uh, yeah, what's your take on that, John? Because we have seen this sort of an, an experiment in these countries to go full Bitcoin. What's your thoughts on that? Well, in El Salvador's case, we discussed this a few months back, and I believe uh, I mentioned that El Salvador was having a bit of a testy relationship with the United States at the time, and it was politically convenient, perhaps, uh, for the for the, for the president to try to say, "Hey, look, you know, we're not getting on so well with the U.S., so why should we be?" effectively using, you know, their, their currency and holding their currency as reserves and let's make Bitcoin legal tender and all these things. And, and, and so, I mean, that, and that was seen as very popular at the time, of course, because, you know, Bitcoin was having a great run at the time. And, and, and so that, I mean, that, that was, you know, you could say a, a, on the one hand, a political decision, but on the one hand, I mean, he may have honestly believed that it made, that it also made fundamental economic sense for the country. And, and so we, you know, we saw all the headlines and it became a very trendy thing to talk about, you know, El Salvador being the first country to to effectively make it legal tender. Uh, it has sort of been a one off until you had the Central African Republic come along, as you mentioned. I don't know what their specific reasons were for uh, for, for, ma for making that decision. I don't I don't know whether they have a difficult relationship with the United States or not. Um, but regardless, I think that the fact that crypto is suffering a big setback here is likely at a minimum to slow the you know potential growth rate of this still extremely small list of countries that have chosen to go down this road so i think that you know formal sovereign adoption of bitcoin as legal tender is probably going to take a bit of a take a bit of a hit here and there may not be anyone else joining that club for a while uh, when things stabilize assuming they do and then maybe the bull market resumes then maybe some others will choose to join the party. And indeed, you could argue that the heavy handed sanctions regime uh, that much of the world is now operating under uh, and to some extent or and having to deal with to some extent, you know, many countries don't actually like it. You know, they, they don't think it's necessary. They, they find it very disruptive. And if they thought that crypto or Bitcoin specifically gave them a way out, a runaround, a workaround, you know, they might consider doing that. Uh, and that, that could be a, a potential long term consequence of the heavy handed sanctions policies that we're seeing implemented as a result of hostilities in Ukraine. So there, there, there's a lot to watch here. It's very, very hard to predict where it's going, uh, but this certainly it, it makes for it exciting, exciting news headlines from time to time. Oh, certainly. You know, with the Central African Republic, this is actually one of the very rare cases for me where I think there is actually Russian involvement with that occurring. So it's very popular now for folks to say it was the Russians. Whenever anything bad happens, be it people they don't like get elected or the prices of things go up. This is a, a trend we've seen expand for several years now. And uh, most of the time, I, I, I generally don't agree. Now, this is one of the cases where I think the Russians actually were involved. And yet I don't see any journalists writing about it. Maybe I'm just not looking in the right places. But Russia's very close involvement with the Central African Republic over the past several years, uh, specifically on the military side. The, the Wagner Group have been deployed there uh, an awful lot. 
Uh, you know, lots of uh, lots of bad stories you find around that. But uh, Central African Republic, the government has uh, a very close relationship with Russia. And I do wonder whether or not the this Bitcoin sort of loophole they've created with the legal tender uh, may have something to do with Russia trying to skirt around capital controls. Now, of course, the Bitcoin market isn't very big, but uh, maybe there's an element there because otherwise the timing seems quite strange for the Central African Republic to do that. Uh, and I wonder if something like that could be could be what's taking place. It, it, look, it's possible. We know, of course, there have been formal announcements of discussions regarding how perhaps to use gold reserves in cross-border trade as a way to get around sanctions. I haven't seen specific headlines uh, you know, in, involving Russia or anyone else uh, regarding using Bitcoin or other crypto to get around sanctions. But hey, maybe those discussions are taking place behind the scenes. Uh, again, you can't rule it out. I mean, look, people want to trade with each other. And not everyone has a dog in this Ukraine fight, and they just want to continue trading with each other. And if that includes trading with Russia, if you don't have a dog in the fight, you don't. And, and so I can certainly imagine that countries are exploring any and all available opportunities to try and keep trading the way they want to trade, regardless of what specific new sanctions regime the US, the EU, the UK, or anyone else is, is working on. Because we're not we're not done yet, right? They keep they keep floating new ideas. It seems almost every day. Yeah, yeah. There's no shortage of them. <laughs> Probably should have been long, long, uh, long sanctions ideas in our in our long short segment. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Stephen says, uh, as the economy is heading for the Stone Age, I'm long on rocks and short on microchips. Very interesting one, Stephen. Uh, Jason is surprised that nobody went long rubber. Have you tried buying tires lately? I have not, Jason, but I can definitely imagine the price of tires going up an awful lot and going up an awful lot more in the future. Uh, that is a very interesting one. Uh, Ron asks, are gold miners still a good bet? Uh, that's an interesting one, John, because, of course, uh, miners are always seen as the, the riskier riskier assets and they take a little longer to uh, react to the gold price moves, especially during uh, uh, risk-off environments, as we're seeing at the minute. That is true of uh, all, but look, the major producers who have proven resource, who bring it out of the ground at a very steady and predictable rate, you know, they, they're they really not, not risky in that sense. And, and many of them uh, also operate overwhelmingly in safe jurisdictions. So, I, but don't get me wrong, the sector as a whole, that's absolutely correct. But if you stick, to just the biggest, most established, mature producers, it's it's pretty safe. But the reason why, in price volatility terms, it it is more volatile, is simply because these are margin businesses. If you own gold outright, you're not owning a, a profit margin; you're owning the underlying itself, and so that will not be as volatile. Whereas the margin between your cost of production of that metal, gold. And then the uh, the price you sell it into the market at post production, you know that margin is going to rise and fall, and that's where your leverage and your profit is concentrated. So it's really a it's really the margin risk that you're taking in the major producers, whereas you're taking huge potentially huge amounts of operational and, expor and exploration risk uh, in, in the minor producers, and that's a very very different game, and that's not one you want to be involved in in a very risk off environment, right? That's that's a dangerous place to be. But I would not re say that the major gold producers do not qualify as basic industrials and basic industrials can function very much as safe haven investments in a stagflationary environment because the stuff they are pulling out of the ground is going to have extremely strong purchasing power. And to the extent their margins do fluctuate, they don't fluctuate by nearly as much as in many other industries. And so don't get me wrong, if gold's selling off, the miners are going to get beaten up. Uh, yes, but the idea that they're getting beaten up because people are afraid they're going to suddenly go bankrupt in a crisis, no, not the major producers. That's just their margins getting squeezed. We do have uh, a few more questions that we are getting on for time a little bit. Uh, Apple is long on allotment, if you can find one. You know, funnily enough, a friend of mine uh, has started setting up a, a you know a small small patch in his back garden, which looked very reminiscent of home front World War II scenes. 
I told him we should set up a, an Anderson shelter as well to complete the look. Maybe we'll see a lot more of those as we go through the 2020s. Uh, Lucid Chronicles asks, do you think Bitcoin will couple with gold soon? And Gerard says, thanks to its limited numbers, Bitcoin was supposed to be a hedge against inflation, but its value has fallen by close to 50% within a year. Does it still qualify as a hedge against inflation? Now, this is a very interesting. I think the pair of these questions uh, can go together to some degree. I have a theory uh, that inflation is going to wreck the tech stock market. Uh, and in doing so, it will decouple from Bitcoin. So, so far, Bitcoin has just been trading mostly as a, a high beta tech stock, very closely in line with the NASDAQ, uh, just with a lot more uh, a lot more volatility, although sometimes not even that. And I think the inflation, what the inflation is going to do is uh, actually change its market nature, as it were, and make it trade a lot more like gold because the scarcity element starts to come into its own, which the tech market doesn't quite have so much. Uh, but this is purely a theory of mine. There is no real evidence to back this up other than when you're thinking of the original ideas behind Bitcoin, it was very much in line with gold it, when it comes to the scarcity and its uh, invulnerability to the printing press. But it's not traded like that since. So I think what we're going to see is a big uh, inflation uh, ruckus where Bitcoin stops trading like the Nasdaq and starts trading a lot more like gold. So it starts a couple of it more with the gold price. Uh, and uh, this this then becomes an enduring theme for a while through the 2020s. Would you have any any thoughts on that, John? Well, it's interesting what you say, and it, it it's similar but different to what uh, to what my friend Charlie Morris says about the relationship between gold and Bitcoin. And you know Charlie too. And Charlie says, look, I mean, gold is the you know it, it's the ultimate safe haven money of the real hard asset economy. And Bitcoin is the best example of a currency for the internet economy, you know, the cyberspace economy, as it were. And so he sees them as very complementary. One will be more exposed to tech by, by, by nature and by definition, which is, of course, Bitcoin. And gold will be more exposed to you know, real underlying happenings with demand for real assets in the economy. But why not combine the two is his is his attitude. And he's been involved in developing an investment product, which does precisely that. And so that that's kind of his take. So over time, if you assume and I think you could say this has been happening for years now, the whole point of, of the Internet economy is, of course, to make the real economy function that much better. You know, at the end of the day, right, we're still consuming food and clothing and need shelter and all this sort of stuff. But we rely ever more on the internet to help us produce those things, get access to those things, optimize all the supply chains around those things, so on and so forth. And so, you know, the the the, the one that one is serving the other, and, and they should naturally remain on a converging sort of trend over longer periods of time. So, you know, maybe your theory is right. You know, maybe over time, Bitcoin and gold will 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 begin to trade more with each other. Now. I mean, there are other reasons why I would disagree with that thesis. I'm not going to go into them here, but based on you know what you say, and also based on kind of how Charlie sees things, you know, it, it's it's hardly implausible. I'm glad we uh, the, there's some common ground between us, John. I know you're always a skeptic, a skeptic of, of the the crypto world, but uh, yeah, there are. I, it will be very interesting to see whatever does happen because we are seeing uh, inflation really start to play out in the tech market and it's bring down Bitcoin as well, which is uh, which is sort of bringing that that relationship. I think I think to a head and there'll be some kind of change there, but we'll we'll find out. And we are getting on very uh, very close to time. One last question just before uh, we go. Sorry for folks if uh, haven't been able to answer your question yet. Um, this is from Andy. Uh, who asks, I understand most of the Fed and other government officials have only ever worked in government. So they now serve politicians, not the people. I think this is a very an interesting question, very uh, fundamental question. What are your thoughts on that, John? Are, are uh, Treasury officials and Fed officials, are they not serving the people anymore because they work in government? Because there are still plenty of bankers as a, uh, was it a revolving door between the banks and uh, and government? Well, yeah, yes. Look, it's not all of them, right? I mean, Jerome Powell, for example, had a very long career 
uh, working for various banks uh, before he ever joined up with the Fed. And that's been true of many other Fed officials in recent years. Yellen and Bernanke were exceptions to that. They were career academics, but but that's relatively unusual in the, in, in the modern history uh, of the Federal Reserve. And when it comes to other central banks, yes, you frequently have had people with a lot of real world experience. However, on balance, based on what I can see, I agree, it's generally true. There has been this trend towards technocracy in recent decades, where people literally go from elite universities into some sort of public sector, something or other. It might be central banking. It might be uh, it, it might be public policy. It might be academia, which is so associated with that and is also nonprofit. It, it, I roll them all in pretty much together. And they make their entire career. They make their entire career moving from one you know, chair to another and then eventually rise into a very, very you know, significant position of power where they are regulating or legislating or executing laws with respect to real world, real business economic activity in which they have themselves never actually engaged. And it makes you wonder, are these people really the ones who have an appreciation for what the real world is like and what the possible side effects, possible you know, counterproductive effects, possible downsides, unpredictable consequences of a given regulation, a given law, a given policy might be? Um, in many cases, they have no clue, perhaps. And in other cases, their interests are so misaligned that is, they don't see any downside for themselves. They have no skin in the game. They're not invested in it. And they're not necessarily even really held accountable if there are some longer term downsides to those policies because, gee, perhaps they've retired by then. I mean, this is what you call control fraud when the people in charge are actually not properly qualified and not properly incentivized to do the best possible job they can. That's control fraud. I think it is absolutely endemic in the world we live in today. And I think it's one reason why other factors equal stock market valuations and other risky asset valuations, multiples, PE ratios, call it whatever you will, should be lower on average than in a historical comparison when you look back at periods when there was relatively less control fraud. It's yet one more reason to be defensive in the world we inhabit today. Very, very well put, John. You know, I've not actually come across that phrase, control fraud, before. I'll need to look much more into that. and Maybe we can explore it a bit more in future episodes. We shall call it there, though, folks. Uh, we have gone on slightly past our, our normal time. Thanks to everybody who has tuned in. It's been a great episode, as ever. Really lively chat, which was wonderful. Sorry if I didn't uh, address your comment or answer your question. We didn't have time for everything. But that's just what happens when more and more people listen to it, which is always, always a good thing. So I hope we covered some of the topics that you found interesting. That's all from us for this week. We shall be back next week. In the meantime, if you leave any comments, if you're watching this as a recording, and if you like and subscribe, that would be really, really good, if you like the show, of course. That's all for the moment. Thanks, John, for your time, and thanks to everybody who has tuned in. Bye-bye.